When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene. Visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues, amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, What does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said, They have had too much wine. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that we get to remember, celebrate. Uh, yeah, Father, that this is, that it, this is such a significant and uh, turning point in our faith and what we believe as your word goes out to the nations as your word gets declared to all people, as your spirit empowers uh, your people to declare the truths of who Jesus Christ is. And Father, as we come to this day marked as Pentecost, as we know it in our calendars, we pray that we may recognize uh, that this is a deeper fulfillment of the promise that you gave, that you would send your spirit that you would give us one that would mediate and, and, yeah, and comfort and counsel us. And Father, that not only that, but help us to see and know who Jesus Christ is. We thank you for that. We thank you that we are here today because of this truth, because of this reality. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I don't know if you, like me, uh, hear the word Pentecost, and this passage that we read this morning comes to mind. Uh, for me, I grew up particularly in a charismatic church, and so as a result, this kind of passage is the one that gets pushed. Uh, it's a strong passage all about speaking in tongues, and it's a phenomenal, phenomenon thing happening. Um, and so in reflection on this passage uh, that we're looking at this morning, this is where I have been personally when I look at this passage when I think about Pentecost, this is what it means to me. Or at least that's what it has meant. I don't know if you are in the same position, but so often we get consumed by the miraculous that we fail to see the ordinary in some senses, if I can put it that way. We see this miraculous event taking place and we kind of sit here waiting for it to happen to us. And we hope that it will. But in other as we look closer, we see that something deeper is happening, something more profound uh, and actually incredible, something that still has traction today, something that is still having a flow-out effect today. So even though we sit here thinking back on Pentecost, there is still a reality of what happened here for us today. So as we looked at this passage, uh, just reading it quickly, this is that event where the Holy Spirit comes uh, in flaming tongues and comes upon people. And thousands are converted as a result of this. People are hearing the words spoken in their own tongue. Uh, verse 3, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And this is quite a phenomenal experience. I mean, who would love to see that happen? Imagine just for a moment the context of what is taking place. You are in a room filled with people that are not, their first language is not English. 
uh, a room filled with people, as this passage highlights, uh, when they say in verse 7, Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? But why do they make this comment? Listen to what they say in verse 8. Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? This is a room filled with people speaking other languages as their primary language. You have Parthians, Medes, Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome. I mean, these, this is a room filled with, this is a diverse room. I mean, I, I don't think I've ever been in a room with so many different people from different backgrounds. No, no, maybe I have. But this is incredible. And then they start to hear something declared in their own language. Amazing. Imagine that. Everybody else around you that is not of your nationality and tongue, those that are supposed to be speaking at this point that do start to speak, speak in your language. How is this possible? I thought they're English speaking, and now they're speaking in my home language. This is amazing. And that gets us excited. This is Pentecost. This incredible event taking place. People are speaking in a language that isn't their own. Now, unfortunately, as I said in the beginning, I am uh, personally guilty of stopping at that event as Pentecost. When I think of Pentecost, yes, this is the spirit poured out, given to people to hear something. But I've actually always failed to read on. I always chuckle when I get to verse 13, and maybe that distracts me, as kind of when we read it now, there was a bit of a chuckle that went out. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they have had too much wine. I can understand why they say that. It is quite bizarre to hear what is being spoken in your own language from a person that isn't from your region. But what is being said? That needs to be the question that is asked. And so for me, as I reflected on this passage, I had to consider a little bit further. And so I only gave us the first section of this passage, but there is so much more to what this passage holds. The rest of Acts 2 really is an outline of what Peter then stands up and preaches. So it's really is a, it's a sermon in one sense, and so it's weird to be preaching a sermon while preaching a sermon. Yeah? And when we look at that, it says in verse 14, Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd, fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. Peter is about to stand up and he is about to explain what they are hearing in their native tongue. The intention was not for them to simply hear something and be blown over by awe and wonder that God could speak to them, but that what God was speaking to them was about to transform and change their lives forever if they were willing to hear this is what Pentecost was about, that a message was rolling out to the nations, not just for the Jews, but for the Gentiles, for everyone. And Pentecost marks that day that here God comes by the power of his spirit to declare the truth of Jesus Christ to all people. This is phenomenal. This is the undoing of basically what happens on the day of, uh, in the, with the Tower of Babel. This is a reworking. It is an undoing of the chaos that was created when they were given so many different languages and division was cast among them. The Spirit comes to reunite humanity under the headship of Jesus Christ. This is what Pentecost is about. The uniting power of Jesus Christ. But let's see what Peter has to say as he explains this uh, this profound event to them. Verse 15, these people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, 
This is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. So what most likely is taking place is the first part of what they heard was a portion of some sort of this quote that he then uh, reiterates coming from Joel. And he explains it to some extent. So before we look at what Peter is about to say, he gives a quote of a passage and he gives an explanation. He gives another quote and he gives an explanation, and he gives another quote, and he gives another explanation. Maybe this is where the Baptists get the three parts to their sermons. But today is going to be three parts to the sermon, because this is what Peter does. He says, in the last days, and he quotes Joel here, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So what does this mean? Well, Peter then explains, fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs. What you have seen, what you have witnessed to about Jesus Christ, those prophesying signs and wonders, this is brought about through Jesus Christ, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. What happened on that hour on the cross when he was nailed? The sky turned dark. The earth shook. And here we are drawn to this passage that Peter is, Peter is pointing us to and he's saying this is what happened. We nailed him to that cross, but, but God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. This is the first section of what Peter is revealing, explaining to the people that have heard this message. So part one, Jesus Christ came through signs and wonders and miraculous events. And he was killed at the hand of man. But death could not hold him. This is part one. This is what the message of Pentecost, where it starts. Part two. He says in verse 25, David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. and You will fill me with joy in your presence. Now, what does this mean? Let's see what Peter has to say. He says, fellow Israelites, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. First and foremost, David, who you acknowledge as this profound, wonderful king, died. Whereas the one that we declare as Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who was nailed to the cross by our own hands, is risen again because of God. Because of God's incredible plan. David was simply a forerunner of Jesus Christ. But the one who we call our Lord and Savior, the true Messiah, is the one that is raised again. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. The son of David, 
Jesus Christ. Seeing what was to come, he spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, that he was not abandoned to the realm of the dead, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. On this day, as they are gathering together, as this message rolls out, as all these events are brought under one kind of into one moment, they can see the picture. Here is Jesus Christ, the Son of Man who came into the world, died at the Son, died at the hands of man, entered into death, was resurrected. And we are now witnesses to this. We are witnesses to the risen Lord. Verse 33, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and he has poured out what you now see and hear. What they experience now is the promised Holy Spirit given to them. The one that Jesus said would come. The gift to them. The one that would help them to see all the more clearly who Jesus Christ truly is. And then we have the final little quote. Verse 34 says, For David did not ascend to heaven, and yet he said, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. Peter draws our attention to the full picture of who Jesus Christ is. The one who was crucified, the one who died, the one who was raised again, who brought about the outpouring of the Spirit, not just for the Jews, but for all who believe. And he is now seated at the right hand of God. He is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. How does that make you feel? To know that. To know that Jesus Christ died for you. To know that Jesus Christ was buried. He entered into death. But death could not hold him. That he was risen again by the power of God. And he has poured out his spirit for us today. He has still given us that promise. And that he is seated at the right hand of the Father. He is ruling. How does that make you feel? Are you joyful? Are you confused? Afraid? Well, I suppose if it is the Spirit at work in us, then there should be a movement of some sort. Verse 37, when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Does this message cut you to the heart to know Jesus Christ, what he has done for you? Does it cut you to the heart that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, that he has conquered the grave, that he has overcome sin and death for us? Does that move you? Brothers, what shall we do? Peter says. Peter then carried on. Repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, 
for the forgiveness of sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That promise of the Holy Spirit is here for us. In repentance of who we once were. And being baptized into Jesus Christ. Into his life. Into his goodness. Into his grace. His mercy. His love. If you have stepped into that, then you have the Spirit in you, at work in you. Maybe this is something you already believe. Maybe this is something you're not yet sure about. But may you call upon the Lord. Declare Him as Lord and Savior through Jesus Christ, what He has done for you. And if you haven't yet done that, do that today. May you be cut to the heart and cry out to him. Repent, be baptized. Verse 39, the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off. For all whom the Lord our God is called. If you're sitting here today and declare the name of Jesus Christ, this is true for you. With many other words, he warned them and he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted this, his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. See the power of the gospel. Have we perhaps lost confidence today in this gospel, this good news, this message that has gone out? I know I'm guilty of that because perhaps I'm not living as closely in this reality. Now, I want to put in one or two things and say, but they had a different experience to what we have. But as we gather like this together, can we not encourage one another to declare Jesus Christ as Lord? And may we see more added to our numbers. Not just people coming from other churches that they know, but new people that have never declared Jesus Christ as Lord. May that take place. May we see the Holy Spirit cutting hearts deeply so that more will be added, not to our number here at Crossword, but the number of God's people around the world. Do you declare Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life this morning? What a wonderful day Pentecost is when we look at it and see that it's not just about some inexplainable kind of event, but that there was a message wrapped up in this event. And as Peter explains it to us, it is the same message that rings out and hopefully will continue to ring out stronger every time. Day, actually. I wanted to say every Sunday. Every day. From our lips as brothers and sisters in Christ. So tomorrow is another opportunity to let this message continue. When you get up tomorrow, you have the ability to declare that Jesus Christ died for our sins, conquered the grave, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. And that he has equipped us with his Holy Spirit. What a joyful message. 2,000 odd years later, and here we sit with the reality still here. Here we are. So in closing, this just marks the start of the series that we are going to continue with into this month coming. We are going to look at the Holy Spirit a little bit more as we've tried to do the last couple of years. And as we gear up for that, weigh up this, 
Weigh up the role of how God the Father and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit have played a role in this message rolling out. And what a joy it is that we get to declare this together today. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Son. Though he was crucified because of our wickedness, our brokenness, our sinfulness, and even though he died, death could not hold him. The grave could not contain him. We thank you that as we search the scriptures and we see pictures of Messiahs such as David, we see that Jesus Christ is the greater Messiah. The one who was able to conquer and have victory, but in such a greater way. And that he is seated at your right hand. And that he is the victorious one. And that he has given us his spirit, poured out his spirit for us. That as we sit here today, our hearts may be cut deeply by every area of our lives that go astray. May the truth of your great news cut our hearts so deeply that we are transformed, that we come in repentance, and that we are baptized in you continually father we thank you that here we are all these years later and your word still goes out it has no less power no less truth but it is still impacting and transforming lives and Father, I pray for us here at Crossword, just a fraction of your body, that we may declare your truth, your goodness, so that more may be added to your body. Thank you, Father. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.